Welcome back to episode two of Barrier Breakers, Tales of Triumph. Barrier Breakers, two, episode two, yeah. Tales of Triumph. I think we triumphed getting here today. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of obstacles, I mean, for today to happen. The, the bus of struggle showed up. Yes, yeah, struggle busting hard. It's great. Yeah. Um, but we met, we're here. Yeah, we're, we're here. here. Set 2.0. It's, it's it, a lot better. It's feeling good. It's a work in progress. So you know yeah. what's cool? I look back <laughs> at the first time that we that we set up that backdrop against that yeah. thing over um, there. And so like, the glow up has been real. Yeah. So. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. So what are we talking about? We're talking about you today. Okay. We want to know your story. We yeah, have, we can get into that. Do we have tissues? <laughs> <laughs> we did not bring any tissues. We should have. We That's what have I, was, to... <laughs> I was like, yeah. So last, I was like, I was watching all the promos and the hype videos and, and getting a bunch of messages about it. And it's like, yeah, tissues would be great. Like tissues, like, I don't know. Yeah. I was asking my husband, I was like, how much should I share? And I was like, I have a tendency to kind of overshare what comes to my mind. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of folks are like, I wouldn't have said that. And I'm like, you're going to get what comes in here is what I put a lot of times out there on the, the social media web. Yeah. So I tell people I suffer from OBS, open book syndrome. Yeah. So it's like, I'm an open book and like, I'll just basically throw it out there, I guess, because of instances in my life where I've, um, it's kind of, I think I've been misunderstood mm -hmm. and I don't like that. So like, I'm going to share everything up front. And then leave the ball in your court, whether <laughs> whether you want to continue or not. Yeah. Um, and not just yours. I mean, anybody's. Like, yeah. Like, here, this is who I am, unapologetically. This is what I've been through. This is why I am where I am. And why you think the way you and do. And why respond I think the, the way like, you do. Or think, respond. Yeah. And, like, and this is why. And if you want to continue, great. If you don't, you can't say I'm hiding anything from you. <laughs> it's all about finding our people. Sure. So everybody's not going to be for Brittany. They're not going no. to all be for Gentry. And that's fine. That's okay. And that's good. Like that, that can be celebrated. Like mm -hmm. there's, there's people, there's, there's different people connect with different people, different personalities connect with different personalities. And the, it's the diversity that makes us beautiful that I think that we just don't honor in, in anybody. Like we don't honor the diversity in any, anybody anymore. Yeah. Hey, we will on this show. Yeah, we will. We're, we will be interviewing I was talking about everyday that, heroes from, oh no, I know, I know. But to let the people know what to expect. Let the people know. <laughs> we will be interviewing people from all walks of life. All walks of life. Um, that have overcome something, whether it's personal, no matter how big or small, sure. you've overcome it and you've grown. Yeah. You know, you didn't let yourself be succumbed by the darkness. Sure. Let's talk about the heroes. Yeah, the heroes. So we're going to start off by uh, talking about why, I guess, you and I are doing this. And a lot of it is just based on our story, yeah. our history. I think understanding gives people like a greater like depth into in investing in the story. Yeah. Right? Because everyone has a story. Mm -hmm. And if we unpack the story, like we, can, we give people commonalities to reach out to know that there's not some kind of like levels of people. It's not like elite, not elite. Yeah, exactly. There's not factions. We're not like, you know, in different colored jumpsuits. It's not the when Hunger we leave. Games. <laughs> Correct. That's what I'm saying. Yes. So, um, but so I think that that's it. Like, we, it's all individualities, and individualities can be celebrated because, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Let's do it then. Let's do it. Brittany. What makes Brittany, Brittany? <laughs> Um, so I'll just start from like the very beginning. Like go all the way Newborn, back. I'm just kidding. What, I was like, it was a dark, cold. <laughs> <laughs> I came out of my mouth. No, so Brittany, I, you know, I am from Memphis, Tennessee. Right. I say that loudly and proudly. Good. I, um, I was raised by my aunt. So my mother went through a period of time where she lost. Okay, this is just me looking back as a young adult. Sure. Understanding why all of this happened Yeah, because I'm a big believer in, you know, everything does happen for a reason. Correct. And I will preface this by saying that I do believe that addiction is a disease. Yeah. So, um, my mother went through a period of life to where she literally lost her father. They were very close. She lost her sister to her battle with cancer, a very long 10 year battle. And then my stepfather died. 
So in the span of a couple of months, she lost three people that were really paramount in her life. Sure. And, you know, she still had three girls to take care of. I was nine at the time. My baby sister was four or five. That weird time period where we're either five or six years apart. And my middle sister was um, seven. So my mom really struggled. Um, I will say this. I also don't believe in making people like, uh, what is it? When they pass away, just making them saints, giving people sainthood, right? <laughs> we all had a past. It makes us who we were and are. Sure. Sure. And I'm just going to keep it real. My mother was, like all of us, she had her flaws. Sure. I love her unconditionally, yep. right? And so my mother went through that time period, and unfortunately, she turned to drug use, um, crack cocaine. And I, a summer happened when the addiction really got a stronghold onto her, and she was gone for days at a time um, one summer. And that summer also, like, the, the lights got cut off at the house. Uh, the water was cut off. We didn't have food. Um, we would, like... To, to get electricity, we ran a long cord to the neighbor's house. Yeah. And, you know, we all stayed in one room with this big box fan blowing on us in the heat of the summer in Memphis. First of all, Memphis summers, brutal. So brutal. much humidity. Yep. So, you know, we had this big box fan. We would have to share like a pack of ramen noodles, which is probably why I hate them now. Just triggered, right, by having to share those chicken ramen noodles, the orange pack. Yep. You have to get the the Oriental blue pack. It was like, oh, really a bad day. So I'm <laughs> so just <bad. laughs> just remembering that. Um, and then having, you know, taking um, a bath, like having to boil water and not being able to flush a toilet and people like. So, right, that was the season of my life. Sure. And um, it was Labor Day weekend. We were supposed to be going back to school. My mother had been gone for about a week at that point. And we moved from our house in uh, West Memphis, well, not West Memphis, the Westwood area in Memphis, Tennessee, to another home in North Knoxville that her partner at the time lived in. And um, things got really bad. My sisters and I were there with her partner's three kids, and I think a fight or something broke out. And it was like, okay, we got to get out of here. So yeah. with no shoes on my feet, um, I picked up my baby sister, and we walked to the nearest payphone around the corner on Hollywood. I'm in North Memphis and I called one of the few numbers I knew, my older cousin at the time. And she was actually with my aunt. They ended up um, adopting us and I called her, told her what was going on. They had no clue. My wow. family had no clue about what we were experiencing that summer. And immediately my aunt dropped everything and came and picked us up. So my aunt, um, from that point forward was, you know, now the the mother figure in my life, the nurturer. Yeah. She did not have kids of her own. Um, she never did. And she, for a reason, right? I think that God made her to be who she was because although she never gave birth to kids, she raised a lot of other people's children, not just my sisters and I, but um, one of her best friends. She was the godmother to one of her best friends. She helped raise her son. Her partner had... Four kids helped raise their children. I mean, even now, she's still <laughs> helping to raise children. So that's just her. She's always there for someone in need. And, um, yeah, my aunt took us in. And, yeah, they had no clue. And so when we had to go in court and testify in order for my mother to get her parental rights terminated, um, I, I really do applaud my mom for not fighting that. Yeah. Because she knew at that point in time what was best for her girls, right? Sure. So she 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 was in and out of you know rehab, Lakeside, getting herself together. And um, my father wasn't really in the picture. Really wasn't. He wasn't in the picture until I um, attempted to reach out to him when I turned eighteen. I found him online um, and just reached out to him to try to form a relationship. So yeah, um, and going back, so. There's been a lot of work, right? When we were in state custody, they put you through therapy, which was very needed. Yeah. Because while my family knew um, about something that happened that was pretty, uh, that I struggle with, to, I, I really struggle with this to this day. Um, when I was eight, my then stepfather um, actually molested me. And he was a deacon in the church, right? I grew up Baptist. I'm still um, a Christ follower and believer. And yet that was something that 
I struggle to separate. I think a lot of people do this. We struggle to separate the word of God and our faith from the people that are in these positions of power. And so I, I struggle for a while to just be like, man, there's evil people in the church. And yet now as an adult, I'm like, dude, there's evil people everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Um, the, unfortunately, our, our safe, what's supposed to be our safe spaces, they're not free of those type of people because you just can't control um, how people think and act and their behavior. And so yeah. um, for years, I, I did struggle with that just. And it was part of the reason why, too, I was like, I'll never get married. Because you never know truly who you're marrying. Yeah, right? right? And um, I did not want to have children to go through some of the same trauma I went through and have to work through that. Because I do realize that while I am very fortunate to be very resilient and tenacious and just, I wasn't always this way. I think I yeah, shared with you before, I was sure. a very sensitive. <laughs> child yeah. you can make fun of me and I would legit shed tears yeah um but life kind of hardened me sure um and so however I do realize that other people don't like you have a fork in a road whether you can rise up to what well, was meant to break you down or unfortunately you just can't get past it right yeah. and so I'm very fortunate that I took the took the other road my faith a big part of it I'll right. try to leave a lot of that out but I can't because the Lord has been good to me yeah. But I mean, you don't have to. Yeah, That's yeah. The thing. Like, so your, your testimony is your testimony, and no exactly. one can take that from you. It's mm -hmm. like no one can take it from me. Yeah. And then and like that's that's what makes it special. It's like when you believe in something because of something that happened, like or because you experienced something. Like that experience can't be removed from you. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to that, I remember I was ten years old, and I didn't know. The full extent now, what I was doing, how powerful it is. So sure. I used to read the Bible. I have, and I still have this Bible actually to this day, a student Bible, like all the tabs color coded. <laughs> it's so weathered now. That Bible thing is, drill <laughs> ready all the time. It has gotten rained on. I took this thing to college, so I still have that black Bible to this day. Galatians and is pink. <laughs> <laughs> so I still have it, and I would fast as a ten year old. I would read my Bible and not eat until a certain time in the day, sure. typically around dinner, and I would just have crackers and water. Yeah. I never realized how powerful what I was doing was sure. until now. Again, looking back as an adult, I'm like, man, there are some things I did, and I was just covered. I, I truly believe that I was just covered from the very beginning um, by a higher power. Yeah. And I, I am very thankful that this year, my mind has always been so strong. Yeah. So that now, as an adult, you know, I will skip the middle crap because we all are in our 20s and we make dumb decisions, boyfriends, friends, jobs. <laughs> so I'll just skip all that middle stuff. Meanwhile. <laughs> Meanwhile, yes. <yeah. laughs> 10 hours later. <laughs> so I'll just skip all that. But my childhood was very pivotal and, you know, forming who I am today. This confident, badass, fearless young woman who... Sure. I just don't take crap, right? Mm -hmm. And so last year, we'll talk about that. Uh, I did get married. This was in 2020. I'm not questioning. I did get married in 2020, <laughs> the COVID wedding. And um, it took a lot of self-work to, sure. to, to trust wholeheartedly, put my life, you know, partner with someone. And we did do, we did do premarital counseling yeah. um, with a great group here locally. And, you know, we worked through that stuff and it was great. We were very honest and open. My husband has seen me crying on floors after the loss of my mother, which came um, the year prior to that. And that was very hard, just unexpected. She she actually passed away from smoke inhalation. Her, uh, her apartment caught on fire and one of the firemen actually was a classmate of mine. And he told me, last year actually that he was one of the ones that found her at the front door trying to get out and at first I was like I'm happy you told me then I'm like playing this image in my mind right it's yeah. very a very traumatic way to um to leave this earth like we all know we have a day and a time and yet when I think of going I'm like let it be peaceful in my bed sure so uh yeah thinking back on that moment um that I'm just trying to picture my mother in that moment. I'm like, I'm, I hope she had some peace. Um, and it wasn't so terrifying. 
Um, Such a hopeless help. It's just yeah, a helpless feeling. It, it really isn't. You know, what's crazy is her, uh, my mother is one of 13 children and her youngest sister passed away from that. They were very close. So when I say I'm a first generation college graduate, my mother actually went to college also. And um, she played for university, well, sorry, Memphis State. She played for Memphis State as a basketball player. And um, when she was there, uh, she got a call that Bird, her her baby sister, had passed away in a fire from smoke inhalation. And so I'm just like, I try to question why sometimes, but I'm like, this is just so freaky. The same way that someone's so close to her, and that also led to some things that she did in her 20s and her Again, she's not perfect, and sure. I won't put out, you know, all of her dirty laundry. And so, um, yeah. So, yeah, my husband has seen me crying on the floor. I had a great cry two weeks ago about missing my mom because, you know, she's missing the big things. She wasn't there for the wedding. I had my first child. She wasn't there. Um, I was six months after having my son. I was also diagnosed with breast cancer. My mom had breast cancer when I was in college, my freshman year at UT. Yeah. Um, she, we go home for, I went home for Thanksgiving break and she actually tells me, hey, I want to tell you this because you need to break the news to your two younger sisters. And I'm just like, what a load oh, to place on me. I have finals when I get back to Knoxville to think about. Yeah. So I still remember telling them that um, about my mom's diagnosis. We were in the bathroom, the hall, the ba- the hall bathroom, the house we all grew up in. and having to go back to school and knowing that my mom had chemo coming up. Yeah. She had a single mastectomy. She had radiation. Now I know that she had pills she took for 10 years. I know this because I'm personally on them now. And so, you know, it would have been great if she had been here last year when I got diagnosed. So, um, yeah, my my baby boy playing on the couch one day with my husband – um, just the right angle kicks me. And I grab, and I'm like, um, that's different. It's very hard, hard area. I've had biopsies before in my past, um, when I was 16, actually, and 21. Um, so I know that felt different. I immediately call a local care center here in Knoxville, and they get me in because I explain my history. So within a week, I'm there um, at the local center, and I have my mammogram, and then they're like, wait, don't leave. They do an ultrasound, and then they're like, okay, then they do a biopsy. And I'm like, I never got to the biopsy stage. Mm-hmm. Typically, it's ultrasound, and you're good. Just wanted to be sure. sure. So at the biopsy, I was like, okay, this isn't great. And two days later, I was literally in my office, which, you know, right across the hall, speaking with um, my partner, uh, my director of operations at the time, and I put, put you know, my doctor on speaker, and I'm like, continue her and our meeting. And Dr. K goes, you know, is breast cancer, grade three, read all all the different, you know, nomenclatures to me. I immediately, the first thing in my mouth was, my son needs me. And I literally just started crying. Marcy, who is a breast cancer, I'm sorry, who is a cancer survivor, um, she immediately grabs me and tells me it's going to be okay. I don't remember anything else about that phone call. I just recall her driving me to my house. And me calling my husband, my mother-in-law, my other best friend who happened to be in town at the time to come and tell them all about my diagnosis. I didn't want my husband to be alone. I want his mom there, sure. um, who was also a cancer, breast cancer survivor. So tell all of them, you know, what I just heard from Dr. K. And the very next day, my husband and I go for me to have um, an MRI to see the whole extent of this disease. Sure. Well, um, not so great news. Find out that my tumor is actually um, eight centimeters, pretty large, which automatically puts you at stage three. There's four stages to breast cancer. And they saw a suspicious um, lymph node that they needed to biopsy. So saw that. My husband is very, uh, I don't want to say upset. I guess the set frustrated, you know, in disbelief. Yeah when we, we hear the extent of the disease and then I get the biopsy and then that's the weekend, right? Um, however, after that, it was so, I was like, I can't do this. So all the while in professional life, I was actually about to open up a real estate firm. <laughs> no, no mind, I just had a baby five months ago. 
just got a breast cancer diagnosis. And so I'm like, something has to give. So I go and sit outside of the firm, the mother office, and I just sit there and I'm like, I'm about to go tell the CEO of the company, I can't do this. I didn't want to tell the person why. And, and yet I'm like, they will understand. And before I could even get out of my car, I know I don't like I'm not lying. My coach, my business coach at the time, texts me, yeah. and she goes, "Are you okay?" And I'm like, "Lord, is that you? Like, yeah. what do you mean?" And so I tell her everything that I have going on. She immediately calls me and she's like, "Hold the phone. I'm going to connect you to someone who shares the same story as you." And the very next day, I'm now speaking with someone who owns three different market centers farms, real estate farms in the Florida sure. area. Yeah. And she told me about just six months ago, she went through the same diagnosis. She had to lean on her team for support. And she was very honest about those around her because she knew she would need their covering yeah. while she fought this battle. And so that was very encouraging. My mother-in-law was there that weekend. My husband had drill. And so having mom there also, I was, I was good, right? I got in my my Bible. I, I'm a very big researcher. I'm a nerd in that way. Sure. Join all these survivor groups, researching as much as I could, preparing for the worst. Because I know the worst could be it's stage four. And at that point, it's terminal. There is no cure for breast cancer. And that Monday, actually, my husband and I's second year anniversary, I had all the scans. I had a brain scan, bone scan, a heart, an echogram, um, something else. I can't remember. It's a blur. That was on a Monday. They had their meeting um, here in Knoxville locally. They have all the doctors they meet, present every case, and they determine a treatment plan all together, which is great, bringing all the great minds together. And after that meeting on Wednesday, the oncologist reached out to me, immediately met with my husband and I to tell me that we're starting chemo the next day. And so I was very fortunate um, to have people that acted quickly. Yeah, I mean, that's... Because a lot of people That's wait thinking just weeks now, and I mean, months. Just... And it was for me diagnosed on September 8th, getting my next chemo, my first chemo two weeks later in, in my arm. Wow. Like they hadn't put my port in yet. And they're like, we cannot wait. It was grade three, which meant that um, it was duplicating fastly. So this sure. tumor had started growing in me and was moving rapidly. My um, proliferation rate um, was was 78%. So that's pretty fast. It, it's rated from zero to, I guess, 100. I don't know. But I just know that anything above, um, I think, 20 is uh, aggressive. They grade it as aggressive. So I knew I had an aggressive, fast-growing tumor. And yeah, chemo did the red devil, adriamycin, cytoxin, very old school, what a lot of women go through. They all come with scary side effects. It was so funny when I met with the I don't forget what she's called, the nurse navigator. She goes, these are what you can expect, you know, stomach problems, weakness, you'll lose your hair. And I go, I don't care about losing my hair. She's like, why is it so gorgeous? And I'm like, it's not mine. <laughs> it was like for years, I guess if people didn't know me, they just thought that the wigs and hair pieces I would wear was mine. And I was like, no, I very seldomly wear my actual hair. So um, I, I'm very, I was fortunate that that wasn't something that, um, I guess, tore me down because a lot of women don't wear hair pieces. And so that can yeah. be something that it, it's a, it's a stark reminder for them every sure. day, right? When they wake up and they see something totally, totally different in the <laughs> mirror. So I realized that I, I had that working for me. I was already used to not seeing my own hair every day. That's, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> but uh, what I was, what I love, my pride and joy was my eyebrows. So in a, good, I mean, left, in a good way. Yeah, in a good way. In a good way. Like, it's crazy that you have this practice already in place. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what I was, I was just kind of connecting those dots. Oh, I know. I know. So, again, this is how, I, when I'm looking back on what I went through, I'm just like, there was stuff already working for my good, right? 828. So, yeah. there were things already there to where it was hard. I don't want to diminish the fight that I had to, to go through. And yet for me, um, I was already, already accustomed to some stuff. Like I, I, I had my way. I didn't care. My eyebrows tattooed them to my face two years ago. I got them microbladed. Mm -hmm. So while I lost the hair, you couldn't really tell yeah. unless you're like up on my face. Um, also, you know, I'm a business owner, so I don't have to ask for work off and have to worry about being fired That's right. from a job. Yeah. Had a supportive, supportive husband. 
We have child care for my son to go to daycare for those days when I could not take care of him. And if child care wasn't in session the weekends, my mother-in-law, godsend, incredible, supported us through and through. Yeah. So I had things there to help me prepare for what I was um, about to go through. So, you know, from September 22nd to December 29th, I had chemo. Um, every other Thursday, aggressive rounds of chemo. And then by the end of that chemo, my doctors were surprised. Initially, they were like, you know, 30% of the time the chemo works. Yeah. It doesn't really work well on breast cancer patients, especially the kind that I had, which was ERPR positive, HR2 negative. And yet when doctor, my doctor told me that, my oncologist, I was like, I don't believe that. I, me and the Lord have a special connection. We're believing in a complete pathological response. I broke down and cried in his office the first time he read my report and told me that it was just stage 3A because I was prepared to hear stage 4. I mentally was. My yeah. husband's probably going to hate to hear this, but I was mentally prepared to hear that. Yeah. Um, so when he told me the stage and that it hadn't spread anywhere, oh, a brain scan was the other one I forgot. Um, I immediately start standing up and praising the Lord, and he looks at my mother-in-law and husband, and they're just like, that's just Brittany. Let her do what she does. Yeah. Continue talking Get to us. Get out of her way. <laughs> yeah. Continue talking to us. She's good. Yeah. And so when I did have the MRI after I finished my chemo, um, there was nothing there left on the scans. They called me immediately. Like the same day I had my my um, my new MRI and mammogram, they called me. And I'm like, oh, it's going to be terrible. It was great news is why they were calling me because there was no sign of cancer left in my body. Oh, and so... I go to see the breast surgeon and he's like, I see your scans here. It looks like everything's clear, but I'll tell you, typically when I go in, there's still some cancer burden left. I have my double mastectomy on February 9th this year. Um, I had a double because I am also BRCA2 positive, which meant I did have an 80% chance of having breast cancer in my lifetime, 43% chance of ovarian cancer, and prostate cancer is higher, colon so I have an elevated chance of getting cancer as opposed to like you or someone else in the general public. So when I found out I had the mutation, I was like, there's no question. Take them both. Yeah. I don't need them. My son's done breastfeeding. It's, it's fine. Um, got the pathology back. And he was thrilled to tell me, he was like, there was nothing left. He's like, I know I told you one thing and yet we we're all stunned. And this is a miracle. Yeah, that's right. See my oncologist the next week. He's reading a report, and he just looks at me with tears in his eyes. At that point, my oncologist refused to let me be seen by the other nurses. He took it very personally to work with me yeah. because he had a doctor, a daughter my age. And so he was just like, you could be my daughter right now. And when he read the report, I could see tears in his eyes, and I tell him, I was like, thank you, doctor. And he said, don't thank me, and does this. And I'm like, oh. It brings me peace to know we're brethren, you know, we shared the same beliefs here. Um, and so, yeah, you know, after that, I had some more, some more surgeries. I had an emergency surgery where I had an infection from the reconstruction. Um, I got my ovaries and tubes removed, just preventive for ovarian cancer, but also because my cancer was hormone driven, they just had to get out of there. Yeah. And then, you know, I'm on one pill for 10 years and another one for two that causes me, as you know, every Thursday, it's just like, Brittany may not be here because I'm in pain. Yeah. Um, or at least not on camera. At least not on camera. No, I'll be in the background posting on social media. So, yeah, yeah that's that's my story in a nutshell, you know. I say all of that and... That's I, the outline. That's the outline. That's the outline. It's chapters. It's chapters. Yeah, that's that's a chapter. This is This is... Unpacking as we go on, you know, things, memories will will come up and remind us of something. But it's like introduction to you, and this is what mm -hmm. makes you great. And I don't, I know that you're like it's not me, but it is you. Like so, stop. I struggle with that, but I know. But but it's like don't don't suffer from I'm just me itis. Like you are you, and you are powerful, and your story's powerful. And your story's powerful, and your story's powerful, and your story's powerful. Yeah. And we all have something to offer. Mm -hmm. Like, God put something in, in each of us. He didn't put everything in, in any one of us. Yeah. So the, it's just aspects of himself, and, and it's the beauty 
um, in finding like stories that are alike, people that think that they're alone and they think that, you know, there's no one that can understand. Mm -hmm. And, and then they come across or they see, you know, a pretty light or a flower and then they actually get to listen and they actually get to see and they actually get to hear and like, and like, Hearing is believing. Like, that's right. Faith comes by hearing, right? Mm-hmm. So someone hearing that you've over, like the story of you overcoming is helps like ignite hope. Like it's an injection of hope in themselves yeah. that things can change. Yeah. You know, I didn't even share on social media because I didn't want last year to be about cancer. I, I, it was about my son. I can't wrap my, I like, I've heard this and I can't wrap my mind. Like, it's hard no to wrap knew. my mind. I know. I know no one knew. And it's like, but the thing is, is you had your, like it wasn't that no one knew. It was like your circle knew. Had my people you had knew. your people that knew. <laughs> and then the rest of you, like, I'm just gonna, you know. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna see pictures of my son because that's what's important to me. Sure. You know, we all have our things that we hold near and dear that keep us going, our why. Yeah. I mean, they're they're right there, right? So yeah. my why is what kept me going, pushed me through. Like I was like, you could take everything. You could take, I don't care. That gives me 10, 5, 15, doesn't matter, five more hours to be with my son. Yeah. That's what it was all for. Yeah. And so I made sure that last year was celebrating his first year of life. Like yeah. you expect when you first have a baby. You've been there. Yep. So yeah, I wanted last year to be all about that. And then once though, once I got um done with chemo, though, I was like, okay, I gotta, I wanna leave this in 2022. Yeah. And that's why I posted and finally shared it. And the reason, the thing that inspired me to start want to start this podcast is the amount of people that reached out to me because they also had things that they were fighting in silence. Yeah. Because I posted, I was like, I know this comes with a shock to a lot of you guys. And yet if you want to reach out to me to have someone to pray a listening ear, I'm open to it. Yeah. It's a connection that we talked about. Yeah, last, ex- absolutely. And then my inbox flooded with people just suffering from so many different things. And I'm like, and yet and but but god like they still are yeah it's incredible yeah so i look forward to interviewing other folks that have accomplished so much in spite of in spite of yeah that's awesome yeah well next week we're talking about you me so i'm going to really have the kleenexes (laughs) we'll have them for you we'll have have virtual ones yeah we need to have virtual kleenexes (laughs) because yeah gentry cries just because he's a crier anyway, but this is how he releases. I, I think it's just like I em, like I empathize and I emote and like I put myself like I put myself into the story, mm-hmm. and that's good and bad. <laughs> <laughs> It'll that, be good. That can be, but that's that's like that can be good, but that can be bad. But the one of the things, and I'll, I'll sh- share more next week, but it's mm-hmm. something that my father imparted with me that's never went away, and um, and I'll unpack that next week yes i look forward to it yep. so you guys tune in next week as we get to know more about gentry yep. and, and his why and why he is my co-host here as we uncover um different barrier breakers and celebrate all their triumphs yep thank you guys for listening until next time <laughs>